Good evening everyone. Okay, let's see if this is actually working. It was it should be working now. Um let's see. I'm still waiting for YouTube to actually show me. Okay, perfect. It seems it is working, so let's get started. I apologize for the usual de delay. Uh, yeah, I got basically everything started and then I realized that my internet is kinda not working, so it like the stream was working but that was about it i couldn't load any web pages and then i tried to la launch like task manager and restart chrome and that failed miserably so i just decided to go back to the old um did you try turning it off and on again method which actually worked but after it um when i'm streaming i actually need to turn on quite a lot of things first of all when i'm launching my computer i need to enter i think like seven or eight different passwords uh, then I need to launch, uh, let me see on the left, there is the full bar for music, um, YouTube live chat, uh, before that obviously I need to go to the creator studio on YouTube, then Mumble to have uh, contact with our, my moderator, IRC, um, the live streaming browser with a set of tabs opened, then a site with um, where the questions which you are asking are flowing. Oh, by the way, on IRC you can now ask questions using question, uh, sorry, uh, exclamation mark Q, and then the question the moderator just have to has to approve it, and then it goes straight to the to my panel actually, which I have on the right. And then I obviously need to start and set up um, OBS, which is the open broadcast software, and the wallpaper wallpaper engine and engine actually and zoom it so it's quite a lot of stuff after a reboot i had to launch before i could actually stream but here i am so yeah so let's get uh, get to it uh, today's topic will be um, basics of anti-reverse engineering basically somebody asked about it on the last stream and i decided that i don't really have a good idea what to do this time so i decided to do this so that's the topic. Um, today's moderator is Kshaku. Kshaku, thank you for being here. If you have any questions then on YouTube chat, then do mark Kshaku KQ mm, so he, he knows that you're asking a question and he can copy paste it to our magical panel. And if you're actually on IRC, you can use the um, exclamation mark Q. I guess Kshaku is going to tell you all about it on IRC. Sweet. So let's switch here since there are some usual news i would like to share with you first of all this is kshaku's website it's the usual one dev kshaku cc and um, well there is at least one post every month and something actually it's it's already like next month kshaku you need to post something really so um, yes but uh, totally if you're into c and other stuff like that you should check it out then we have the usual which is live overflow his, uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure you know his YouTube channel since I'm advertising it basically every single time. Life Overflow streams about low level security and capture the flag, and he's really awesome at it, so I would totally recommend you to, well, to check him out. Okay, that was the one's question is like, why do I not hear myself on the headphones? Okay, now I can hear myself. Perfect. So, that's Life Overflow. 
Apart from that, we also have uh, Mormus CTF, who is a live streamer like myself, and he is doing live streams about CTFs. Um, somewhat more technical than I do, I, I believe, though um, while I'm also obviously doing technical stuff. I totally would recommend uh, to subscribe to Mormus as well. And now some news. Uh, as you know, Black Hat is happening and DEFCON is going to happen in a few days in Las Vegas. I actually didn't go this year, which is probably, I don't know, the first time in three years, four years that I've been flying there. So I'm actually happy for the break. Las Vegas is actually a place which I would recommend visiting uh, one time in your life to see how it is. I'm probably not, wouldn't recommend going after that, unless you're into casinos and stuff like that, then, then it's a different thing. But yeah, but hotels, um, mm, casinos, and a lot of people, and super hot air outside, and the desert, that's basically Las Vegas, so yeah. If you're going there for a Black Hat or Defcon, that's totally, totally fine, but apart from that, it's not probably not the best, best sightseeing place. I know some people do love it, though. So, um, stuff from Las Vegas and Black Hat is actually flowing in, and first thing we have is from Tom uh, Gallagher, I'm sorry, I'm ter terrible with names, posted the um, Microsoft um, top 100 researchers, security researchers, and as we can see, Mateusz Jurczyk or Juru is the first on the top of the list. Congratulations, Mateusz, well done. Uh, Mateusz is a member of Google's Project Zero and also vice captain in Dragon Sector in my CTF team and also a long time friend of mine. So yeah, double the congratulations, well done. We have quite a lot of people here from Project Zero like James for example or Natalie and I'm pretty sure if we would go through all of these open hogs, which is the manager, who is the manager of uh, Project Zero. So congrats to everyone all around. So that's one thing. The other thing is Pony Award nomination. So Pony Awards didn't happen yet, but it seems that the nominations are in. So if you're wondering what a Pony Award is, a Pony Award is basically the most um, renowned award you can get in the field of offensive security currently. And uh, it's uh, it has like two kinds of categories, the technical one and the one with, uh, with basically a wink, which are like, for example, for the most epic failure and so on. So, so yeah, uh, Pony Awards are given once a year on Black Hat. Um, I actually care about them because I have a Pony Award myself. We got one with Mateusz for uh, Boxbound for research we did. So, so yeah, uh, I really like them and I always look forward to see the nominations. And the nominations weren't here this morning, so they were just announced. And I think that actually on... Um, yeah, actually on, on this evening in Las Vegas there will be the award ceremony. So, um, best server side, I'm just going to skim through the names actually. We have a, <laughs> the only critical back in OpenSSL uh, to get a... Okay, that's awesome. It's Robert Świenski who is the author of, uh, author of uh, NSJL, for example, which is, the, you, you know, your default sandboxing solutions for CTF. Uh, he's also a member of Dragon Sector, surprisingly, and a member of my team in Google. So, yeah, congratulations, Robert. Um, okay, NSA Equation Group. As you can see, nominations can be all around. You don't have to nominate yourself. Someone can nominate you. So we have NSA, for example, being nominated. Then we have Tavis Aromandi, also from Project Zero from Google. Um, Natalie and Tavis from Project Zero. Then um, Maxim from, I actually don't know. So what's this? Let's see what's the bug. Um, here, the, oh, the Cloudflare bug. That was beautiful. That was an excellent bug. I really liked it. Um, if you're, it, basically the story goes like this, but I think Tavis started doing some getting HTTP packets from the internet from random places. And he noticed that at the end of the packets, there's some random looking data and he started um, looking at it and it turned out that Cloudflare, which is a content distribution network, actually was leaking memory inside HTTP packets. That was, that was just amazing. And well, being a security researcher, he knew how to follow up. Uh, then we have a, a really awesome back in Window Defender. I actually do, um, do know this one. So yeah, so Tavis is doing an awesome job, as you can see. I am not familiar with this bug though, so so yeah. 
Slipper and Kelvin also have a nomination for a buffer overflow and identity firewall feature of Cisco. I am a huge fan of um, of vulnerabilities and security products. That that is like a thing which should not happen, right? If something is a market that does a security product as this will make your company secure, then it should be like flawless basically. And then we find like bugs and, and that sort of code. So yeah. There we go. Then we have another category, which is best client side. That was, by the way, the uh, server side. So let's see what's up in the client side. We have uh, Ryan, um, Haifei, Bing, and unknown hackers for a Microsoft Office OLE. OLE is like a technology which is so old, but they, yeah, they found a bug there, and it's nominated for. I'm actually not familiar with this bug, but. Given that these two gentlemen, I believe you're gentlemen, I might be mistaken though. Um, yeah, these two people did a presentation on SciScan and I guess Ryan is also credited. There might be might have been some research collision there. Compromising Linux SNES Sony processor opcode. I am with, from Chris Evans. No, I actually do know this one. Um, Chris Evans is for time sometime he worked at Google, then he moved to Tesla. And then, and currently, I think he's actually like doing research on his own. And he found um, basically there was a video format which required, or or am I mixing bugs? No, I, I think it, that was it. But there was some kind of like a, a video or audio format that basically was using some some NES emulator stuff. I, I'm not familiar with details, but on his blog, there are details, so you can just click it here. I guess I should give you the link though, right? So here we go. Mm, yeah, Chris actually published a lot of cool bugs recently on his blog, so you, you should totally check it out. Chrome OS exploit, one byte overflow and symlinks. I do not, I do not know this bug, but CRS DNS library, I do know the, this library, so yeah one byte overflow into which actually was turned into an exploit that is amazing stuff then project zero versus malware protection service and we have project zero's members all around including tavis natalie mateusz visual suspects as well as loki heart and i am beer yeah malware protection service which again is uh as you know a security feature a security product and their vulnerabilities there yeah, this should not happen. Seriously, I mean, in the security community, we should be smarter than this, right? We should not, we should not create code which does make more risks for the users. Poning the Nexus uh, during Cancer Quest. So, as you may know, Cancer Quest is actually a kind of a competition where, for proving exploitation of a fully patched modern browser, for example, on a fully patched operating system with zero days, obviously with zero days, so people come prepared with zero days there, well, you can get money for it. And money is around like $50,000 or $100,000, so they're re re sorry, usually really, really good bags there. And uh, yeah, so this time it turns out that that was also the case. A full exploit chain against Android Nougat and a remote exploit against Chrome, followed by Sandbox Escape. So that's amazing stuff. Then we have another category, which is best privilege escalation. So assuming that an attacker has root, well, a user access on your machine, how does he get root access? And we have Jan Horn from Surprisingly Project Zero. Um, broken check and memory exchange permits guest breakout. Is this the bug I am thinking of? Um, in, it's in Zen actually, so it's probably not the one I'm thinking of, but yeah, sounds actually awesome. Hypervisor bugs are another way of privilege escalation actually, so I um, should read about it, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Task t, t considered harm for, I probably didn't. I'm not sure about this bug either. I should read more posts from pro from Project Zero. I and Beer is also from Project Zero, as you can see, I guess, from the template. Mm, then we have Drummer, deterministic row hammer attack on mobile platforms. Rom row hammer attack is 
basically one of the most awesome attacks I've ever seen on PCs. It's basically like this, but you have RAM memory, which is, you know, a DRAM, for example. And it turns out that, well, DRAM stands for dynamic RAM. Well, the dynamic is actually, it means that it needs to refresh all the bits in memory. Uh, and I think it happened like every 64 milliseconds or something like that. Now, some people in the past, including uh, later Project Zero members, discovered that, well, I, actually, I think it was originally discovered by someone outside of Google, I don't remember who, and then Project Zero members started poking at it a little, and um, and not only Project Zero members, and they found that uh, how to make it actually exploitable in a privileged escalation way. Anyway, so the problem is that if you start accessing memory all around cert in certain patterns in RAM, that actually drains the capacitors which actually hold the bits, and that makes changes in memory, right? So you like poke some um, variables all, uh, all around the memory and it changes the value of some other variable in memory, but something that shouldn't happen. And it turns out that I think it was even triggerable using some memory access patterns from JavaScript. So using JavaScript, you could basically like flip some bits in memory you even didn't even touch, right? Because of draining the capacitor in DRAM, because the way of DRAM works. So yeah, so that was Rowhammer, and uh, and it seems there was, it was nominated by the by the way, and I think it even won a Pony Award a year or two years ago, and it seems there's some research based on that for mobile platforms, which which already sounds really awesome. Then we have Blitzhart, Blitzhart, Blitzhart. It's what's Blitzhart? Hmm. Kinlab. Kinlab is also the name that is already, I spotted here a couple of times. They, uh, they are a really like an awesome group of researchers, basically. Though I do not know what this is. I would, what, what product is it in? Apple something. Zero day initiative. Apple OS X. Okay, so it's OS X. Perfect. And then we have another something. I have absolutely no idea what this is. Ubuntu Linux. So yeah, Ubuntu Linux from Pwn to Own again. Then we have some crypto stuff. Mm, let's go quickly through quick sorry, crypto stuff since I'm not really familiar with it. Um, okay, critical vulnerability in JSON web encryption. Like in the standard itself? That's that's amazing. Then we have oh Quan, huh? isn't he working at Google as well? Mm. It's probably a popular name. Though. It might uh, 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 it might not be him though. I'm pretty sure he works at Google. Flip Feng Shui hammering and needle in the software stack, but has an awesome name, quite a lot of people, and uh, Flip Feng Shui is a new exploitation vector which allows an, uh, an attacker to induce bit flips over arbitrary physical memory in a fully controlled way. Uh, is it? Yeah, it's a raw hammer bug, I guess some more research on based on raw hammer bug, which is, which is cool. First collision of SSH, yeah. Uh, for, and obvious people. I mean, that attack, the first collision, was actually really loud. I also talked a little about it on my stream, so congratulations uh, to Mark, Ellie, uh, P Pierre, and Anja, and Yarik. That was, that was an uh, awesome piece of research, actually. Then we have best backdoors. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, so this is a fun category because, you know, um, sometimes when you buy an appliance, a router, or some other hardware, there is a um, debugging feature there which was placed, so, you know, like, for a legitimate purpose, for example, so that the technical support can actually log into your device and help you fix your problem. But um, most of them, or some of them, are not done in a correct way, or shouldn't be done at all, actually, therefore... Yeah, we have, for example, SonicWall, which again is a security appliance provider, and uh, with some running some Dell software, it seems, which had, yeah, which had basically some backdoor installed, 
and and so on. So yeah, this is a fun category. Best branding. Best branding is, I guess, the it's a kind of um, tongue-in-cheek category with you know an eye wink about uh, well which bug was marketed the most because. We actually laugh on the security scene f about bug marketing, and it gets even funny, funnier if you actually like. There was a case when somebody hired a, a marketing agency to do some, to do you know, press about a given bug, and they actually leaked the bug before it was was officially published. So, so yeah, so there are some mentions here as well. Valbius, Cloud Bleed, Dirty Cow. I have no idea what Ghost, but is. And drink road, I, I just don't know. Epic achievements, uh, yeah, I, I guess we. I'm not going to go through all all of them. I oh, most innovative research, American Fuzzy Lop. Congratulations, Michael. Mm, as you probably know, if you speak Polish, I had uh, a live stream with Michael Zalewski about American Fuzzy Lop. There are uh, Polish subtitles which translate pretty well to English subtitles on on YouTube. If you're curious. Ghost Telephonist, I have no idea. Um, box phone Reloaded, yeah, I was looking for this, basically, for um, Mateusz and his uh, his last research. Pretty cool stuff. Um, if, uh, yeah, if you're on Black Hat, then I think he has, a, or if you were on Recon, then I think he had a talk about it. Lamest vendor response. Uh, it's a category, also like a tongue in cheek category, like a iron category, where if you know, if you report a bug and the reply is, "I'm go, we are going to sue you, get your lawyers," then then this kind of stuff basically goes into into this category. Most overhyped bug, I guess the name is self-explanatory. Then we have the best song because, you know, it was kind of like Oscar-like, so they also squeeze in fun, funny categories like best song. Sometimes the songs are quite good as well. Most epic fail, which is basically... Yeah, the name says it all, right? And we have here stuff like uh, Cloud Beat again by, by, uh, by Cloudflare, but this time it's not like... Oh, it was a really cool research, but yeah, that, sh that shouldn't happen, folks, that shouldn't happen. And Lifetime Achievement Awards, I guess there is... Uh, oh. No, no, no. We no longer uh, announce nominees. The winner will be announced. So, okay. So, it turns out we don't know who might get it. And most epic ownage is for the biggest hacker attack, basically, that happened during last year. And we have WannaCry here for obvious reasons. Credit unknown, probably North Korea. That says it all. Flexi Spy Hack, which I don't know. Shadow Brokers Dump, totally. Credit Russia, straight up Russia. Yeah, that's, that's quite funny. So, okay, I totally recommend you check it out, and I think, again, to either today evening or tomorrow evening, Vegas time, we should hear who are the winners of this year's Pony Awards, basically. Let's go further. Here, this open tab was supposed to remind me to tell you that next four streams, which will happen during two weeks, there will be two English streams next week and two English streams... Uh, the week after will be done with a guest presenter uh, that would be Artem Honorary Bot, as you may know him. Um, Shishkin, I, I apologize if I totally butchered the name. I, I am bad with names. Anyway, he's uh, basically a Windows debugging enthusiast. He's a fan of Windows reverse engineering, uh, debugging low level stuff, and he's been using Windback or WindBG for kernel debugging for se several years. And uh, like, for example, customizing blue screens of death or building uh, Windows kernel source tree. Uh, you probably might know that when Microsoft did release uh, the source code of Windows kernel for the version of XP and version of like the next one, 2003 or something like that, it was called Windows Research Kernel. And some people actually did build it and did run it. Uh, yeah, Microsoft didn't release any other versions of Windows kernel, unfortunately. And it was only the kernel, it wasn't, for example, even the Win32K. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, sometimes he, do, he he says he accidentally discovered things like, for example, SMEP bypass on, on Windows 8 or how to disable patch guard and stuff like that. So he will be presenting on basically debugging the Windows kernel using WinDBG, including how to set everything up. And this will happen next Wednesday at the same time, next Thursday at the same time, which means the Polish stream will actually be moved, by the way. And then the Wednesday after that and Thursday after that, so there will be four live streams, basically. Yeah. So, oh, I, I even see he is here. So, hello, hello. I totally invite everyone who is interested to come, especially that I know that a lot of folks did ask for WinDBG kernel stuff and so on. You will finally get it, thanks to, thanks to Artem. Sweet. Uh, I am going to give you a link to his Twitter, uh, especially that uh, I believe he, even though present on chat, cannot actually give links. I actually apologize for that. I wanted, I, I think I have everything set up so that you can paste links on chat, actually. I mean, I have a moderator present all the time during the live stream, so spamming is not a problem, right? You just right click and the spammer is gone, but... But yeah, but it seems that I cannot actually allow my viewers to, like, there is no technical option for me to allow my viewers to post link on YouTube chat. My apologies. So, okay, that will happen next weekend in two weeks. And now let's go to the missions. As you know, missions are small CTF-like challenges which happen, which I actually announced after the live stream. After today's live stream, there will be also a mission. Uh, quite fun one actually. I had fun creating it. So and a little more, there will be a little more programming involved than usually. So yeah, please let me know what you think. Uh, this is the last mission which took, which well was announced last week, and uh, basically it goes like this: that the agents in training, right? Because the the whole story develops from some like um, secret agency which has agents which go and steal stuff and then send encrypted messages to the central and the central has problems decrypting them. So this time the agents in training send this message like um, 9A, 6O, blah, 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 right? And um, actually it's OTP XOR, which means it's a one-time pad XOR. It, it's actually means that the key length is the same as the length of the message. Therefore, if you XOR it, there is no way to decipher it because all the weaknesses of XOR uh, basically boil down to the problem that the key was repeated. Now, if the key is long enough and like as long as the message and it's passed correctly to the other side, then that's actually unbreakable and nothing you can do. But passing the key to the other side was the problematic thing because it boils down to how do you protect the key? Oh, you need to encrypt it. How do you encrypt it? And so on and so on. So yeah, anyway, so they did use OTP XOR and sent the message, but they, they, well, lost the key. So they didn't provide the key. So how do you break an unbreakable cipher? Quite a lot of people actually managed to. Now, what you did get, you got a uh, binary. This was a binary, so we had to do some reverse engineering, and you would notice that during reverse engineering that actually what would happen is that the key was randomly generated using a crypto unsafe, crypto, well, a pseudo random num, sorry, pseudo random, <laughs> pseudo random number generator. Uh, it was just using rand based on seed which was based on time and that isn't secure at all and even as a hint i did put the date of when the when this was created so you didn't have to search through i don't know the whole week of the time but just through the 24 hours basically of this day plus minus 24 hours due to the time zone differences right so yeah what you had to do is you had to basically try to decipher this password by basically trying each and every key generated by in that time second on a second granularity basically because uh, it was using the time function and the time function actually has second granularity so yes and the difficulty was eight slash seven which means not a lot of solutions not a lot of solutions but some were there so yeah that was what was it about now, uh, there's already, oh, by the way, this presentation, as usual, is linked 
it was lights down below and mm, you can just click it and you can click on all of these this is uh, linkable material so i guess we can see what adrian laskowski did uh, did post here and he did post for example the well the part which you had to reverse engineer and here's basically how the, the function was generated and i'm pretty sure he did write here somewhere that it was actually the run function which was uh, which was generating it yeah i kind of on purpose compiled it with optimized to be optimized so it actually the code wasn't as readable as it could be but i believe it was still pretty easy to reverse engineer even for more um, more new people to yeah, to this basically so yeah you basically had to brute force it and uh, in the end you would get one basically one um proper password which uh, which would be well fully ascii that's one thing it's, it's probably guaranteed that it would be full ascii and probably one of the only strings which you would get which would, would give you only printable ascii characters so congratulations to adrian then we have from arthur novak uh, similar also a write-up again i'm really happy for uh, for you folks that you are posting write-ups because again if somebody was not able to solve it then just take a look on the write-ups they are usually pretty detailed you can learn a lot and if you read like the write-up for a task which you actually did try then you know what's it about and you can find also out some tricks yeah i guess this is this is the the part which says it all right we have the time and we have it fed into as rant and then we are generating using rant there is this looks weird but it's actually like modulo um i think modulo 256 of or 257 something like that or or similar or like a similar value so so yeah thank you for posting uh, the write-up arthur then we have Foxtrot Charlie who also posted a write-up. We can also take a look. Um, it's it's actually cool because I don't think I think like each person used a different tool. So yeah, that's actually really awesome. And unless this is some weird no, this isn't either. What is it? This is Radari. I don't know actually. It's probably written somewhere there. So Fox Charlie, thank you for posting the write-up as well. Then we have some solutions uh, from Marek Zori, who was actually the first person to... Yeah, the first person to solve it. And uh, as in the fastest person to solve it. Congratulations. And from um, Vax, who also posted, I believe, the code and saying that don't try... Yeah, the, uh, it's the code. Don't try doing this under linux as it won't work or didn't for me yes that's that's uh, a really important thing windows and linux random number generators are different like the, the standard run function i oh, actually actually can type here the standard run function is implemented differently on linux and differently on windows i mean glibc and um, msvrc there are two different implementations you will get two different results if run on Windows, it should be run on Windows. If run on Linux, it should be run on Linux. Or you could actually check what, what is the implementation on the second platform and port it to Linux. That's also doable. And the implementation on Windows is uh, way easier than, than the one on Linux, actually. On Linux, you can actually choose which random number generator you can use. I think there are like um, three or four different. Well, actually, there are two different and the rest is basically a group with different set settings. Yeah. And that's it mission number 10 will be is coming up after this live stream and uh, i would like to thank foxtrot charlie who is uh, one of the newest members of uh, my live stream crew who prepared these slides and um, so i didn't have to thank you very much cool now is there anything else no so 40 minutes in and we can finally start the stream so i'm probably going to do a, a little longer stream today like maybe 45 minutes starting from now so the topic is supposed to be um, oh let, let's start with the questions first I, I believe there are some questions already at least one 
So one question is, I was watching the Polish live stream and uh, the Polish live stream is about ray tracing currently. What's ray tracing? So ray tracing is basically a technique, like a um, graphical, it's basically a technique where you have a 3D scene and you do a 2D, two dimensional image out of it. And it boils down to having a, a, basically a camera, a screen, and then the scene, which for example, could be um, spheres, right? And sending a ray for each pixel of the, of the screen actually and seeing if it hits anything, and if it does hit anything, then actually trying to calculate what color it should be, or if it doesn't hit, then like what's the default color. And this gives you, basically, if you if done correctly, uh, photorealistic graphics. And it's, uh, yeah, since I'm also doing programming on my Polish live streams, then, uh, then yeah, that was one of the topics. I guess I can show you the the result, the current result, because I'm still working on that ray tracer. At least I could show you if I didn't close the browser. Uh, let's go here, let's go to my blog. And then we have... I think that's the newest one. It's JPG or PNG. That's actually 21. Yeah. It's 4K, so uh, let me make it smaller. How do I make it smaller? Well, I guess I cannot. But yeah, um, I didn't create this scene. This scene was created by Ufuk Ufuk, for, and I got it from uh, cgtrader.com. And this is the current result of my ray tracer, which I'm implementing on the Polish live streams. Yeah. Okay, now we can get going and let's start with like basics of anti-reverse anti engineering. So how to make the life of a reverse engineer harder. And there are basically, so uh, let me give you a theoretical introduction into it, right? We have basically a couple of, I think like two or three groups of what could you do. And um, none of these groups give you a guarantee that nobody will actually analyze your code. What you do in reverse engineering, in anti-reverse engineering, you actually buy time. So each trick which you use buys time. And the more known, the more, um, uh, how do you say it? Uh, the more the trick is into common knowledge territory, then the less time you buy. The more the trick is novel, then yeah, then the least time you buy. And also the more the experienced person, the less time you buy, and the more you buy the, the person who is actually reverse engineering the the binary, then well the more more time you buy. And even if there is enough tricks you might make the person give up at, eventually, right? But I wouldn't count on on people like really professionals giving up on something before they actually hack it or reverse engineer it in this case. So what you can do, what, well, you can do a couple of things. First of all, what are the, you can attack the tools and by attack the tools, I mean, you can try to detect them and change the flow of, of the application. Uh, one of the most common tricks is you detect a debugger, that a debugger is attached and then you actually, uh, well, Right, for example, no, my application will not run with a debugger attached and exit, right? Though this isn't the best thing to do. Another, a different idea is, for example, to um, not exit, but go into a different flow of the application. So if a debugger is attached, then redirect the, whoever is analyzing it to a different different branch of a program, which does something different or like doesn't do anything clever at all is, for example, like a huge loop with a lot of branches that doesn't do anything smart, right? And uh, yeah, so that's that's basically like what you do after detecting that's, that's a different thing. But yeah, one thing is like attack the tools, uh, which means uh, detect the debugger or make the debugger crash if you're able to, or um, if somebody is using a disassembler, like for example, IDA, then make the code not readable in a disassembler, make the code not decompilable in the disassembler, which 
uh, which uh, does increase the time which somebody has to spend because they have to... They're obviously anti-anti reverse engineering techniques, which I'm also going to discuss with each of these. So yeah, so that's the first thing. And the other thing is obfuscate the code, which means make the code much harder to read. And uh, not basically not based on the, you know, making the opcodes weird or, or something like that, but also something like that. But for example, think about a virtual machine. You implement all the logic of the application in a virtual machine. So somebody has to first reverse engineer the, the whole virtual machine, right? Uh, know what are the instructions and so on, and then write a disassembler for the virtual machine. So you actually... Mm, by time by having him, well, the person do it, right? Uh, now, the, I guess even a better technique would be, hey, how about in that VM, using bytecode, you actually implement another VM, and in that, even another VM. So you basically do nested VMs, and there are some protectors on the market which do like, I don't know, like 20, well, a layer of 20 VMs, VM and VM and VM, obviously they are, mostly the code is auto-generated, and um, and yeah, it increases time greatly because it basically forces the uh, the researcher, the reverser, to go from the I can do it manually territory into the I probably need to write some script to do it territory, which also takes additional time. Uh, question: Where are you going to start mm, English coding streams? Uh, well, I guess uh, if I run out of security topics or there is a request for a English coding stream, then, then yeah. Uh, then that will be the time when I will be actually start doing English coding streams. <laughs> yeah, best advisor says on the chat that, oh, 20 VMs, that sounds way slower than Java. Uh, Java actually has just-in-time compilation, which makes it rather fast in comparison. And uh, yeah, it is slow, but... The idea here is not to, you, you basically don't want to hide most of your code usually. You want to hide this critical algorithm which is top secret for your company or you want to, um, for example, hide the product key checker or something like that so, you know, so the pirates don't uh, pirate your product and so on. So basically slowness doesn't matter because it should not slow the application now. We all know that there are games, for example, which had DRMs which were slowing them down, and as soon as the, the, the DRM was ripped off by, for example, the producer of the game, then it actually got 20% more FPS. So, yeah, um, ideally it should not slow down the application. Does spaghetti code work? There's a question. Yes, spaghetti code is also uh, one of the obfuscation te techniques. Um, so okay, let's do let's do some coding, okay? Let's make the stream actually technical. And uh, what? I guess we can do some really basic stuff. Um, on the internet, you probably can find lists of anti-reverse engineering tricks. For example, uh, oh my god, I'm ashamed. I forgot the person's name. Uh, Peter, he worked for Symantec and then he worked for Microsoft. But he had a really awesome list of anti-reverse engineering tricks. Ferry? Peter Ferry? Something like that. I'm really ashamed. I'm, I forget the name, but I am, as you have already noticed, really bad with names. Peter Ferry Anti-unpacker anti tricks, that's, that's actually it. So... Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to just give you a link, but do look for other articles and other from from both this person and from any other person who might have created one, because it lists. Well, these tricks are mostly old, mostly Windows related, but yeah, a list to go through to see what kinds of tricks there are is better than no list at all. So the most basic thing is basically to detect a debugger, right? So you have on Linux GDB attached or for on Windows uh, only DBG attached or something like that. And um, how do you detect it? How do you know from an application that, oh, I'm being debugged, I should actually like do something else. So I'm going to do a couple of um, 
show you a couple of easy, the most basic tricks which you do. Let's start with Linux maybe because we, Linux is quite uh, quite fun. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, something which will, you would not expect is related to argv actually. And you probably should not rely on it, but it is there and it is a known behavior. Let's start with actually outputting the argv0, which as you know is the way you invoke the program. It's not the name of the program, it's the way you invoke it, as in the, uh, the, the first chunk of it. I do need to run my... is my Linux machine working? It is. I'm actually, actually after a reboot, so I wasn't sure it did work. Okay, GCC, test C, um, test C, yeah. And I'm going to launch it normally and see what happens. A out is the thing which was, uh, well, outputted, right? Put out. Now, let me run it in GDB. And uh, as you can see, I'm passing exactly the same string, right? So I'm, I had dot slash a out here and dot slash a out here. And now I'm going to, um, it's still loading because I have obvious uh, pwn dbg script installed. I'm going to run it and look what it actually outputted. This isn't what I've typed. This isn't this. It's actually a full blown path, absolute path to an application. And uh, this is one way to recognize if you're going, if you're under a, de a debugger, if usually your application is started in this way, or just using a command even without it because it's in path, and then suddenly the debugger puts and runs it with the whole absolute path, then you might have GDB installed. That's obviously faulty. I mean, you, you can have false positives in this method, so it's not the best method, but it is where I wanted to, to uh, tell you what it is. So another method which you can use is related to opening a file, basically. Let's open a file. It's one of the most basic things you can do, right? So you do fopen, then you do uh, some random file, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter, it actually doesn't matter at all. Passw, for example read binary and now I'm going to print out uh, the ID of a file. I always remember how the, how the function is called which outputs the... because uh, this is a high level handle basically but what I do need is I need a low level handle and there is um, a function which does it. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to search in a decent way. File pointer to Linux and file. No, descriptor. Oh yeah, it's here already. File no. Yeah, I always forget it, but it's it's so easy. It's file no. You give it a stream and it gives you the, mm, the file descriptor like in, you know, a number. You know, like uh, standard input is zero, standard output is one, and so on, so this is this kind of file descriptor. Okay, file no f, and let's compile it again. Oh, no, this is not compilation. This is compilation, I'm going to run it. And it's, uh, I opened a file and it's five. Why is it five? It's already, it shouldn't be five. Uh, why, why shouldn't it be five? Because standard error is zero, sorry, standard input is zero, standard output is one, standard output for errors is two, and f and three should be actually the, f the file. So this is quite weird. I'm actually going to investigate now what's going on because I, this is not what I expected. I expected three here. So let me recompile it. Let me run it again. And let me, oh, I cannot create a new. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's a socket. Why does it have a socket open? I have no idea. What is this socket? Yeah, I don't know. It might be related to the console, actually. So I'm, I'm quite curious. This shouldn't be here. Hmm. 
Yeah, later, later. Uh, not the topic of a stream. Anyway, it's five now, right? So now let's run it under a uh, debugger, because whatever I want to show you should still apply. And run, and now it's still five. Okay, <laughs> this is fun. Uh, it might be related to Pwn DBG. Or they change it in GDB. What I wanted to show you is, I wanted to show you that actually this, um, this changes. And it did change on older versions of GDB, maybe they changed the behavior. Well, I guess you cannot use this trick at all, but uh, currently, previously, GDB actually had to... Um, yeah, actually it had created two file descriptors which were leaked into the child, and you could actually see that that the number of file descriptor in re re after reading a file changed. I guess it doesn't doesn't apply anymore, and I also have the mystery of actually what the hell is this? Um, are these two additional file descriptors? I guess I might blog about it later on. Yeah, maybe I just like found a kernel bug. No, or I was, for example, owned. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Mm. So. There's a question. I mentioned that my Polish streams had subtitles on them. Is that true for OS Dev? No, it's actually true only for the for the one stream I had. Well, two parts of a stream um, I had with uh, Michael Zalewski with her uh, They are they were created by Piotkosia, and these are the only ones I have subtitles for, and they are Polish subtitles. But out Auto translation from Polish to English is way better than translation from you know like hearing what we said into English, so it's still a lot better. Uh, mm. Okay, there are some questions, so let me quickly uh, go for it. Is install shield considered a form of anti anti debugging? Uh, no, I don't believe it is, but I I don't know if it has any features like please enter a, a product key or anything like that. If it has, then probably that's somehow protected by it. By itself, an installation program is not an anti-reverse engineering method, and usually you can extract most, most of them quite easily. So, anti-reverse engineering for embedded devices and real-time operating system is very hard due to limited resources. Uh, yeah, basically that's true, but there are methods which are basically run once and then don't impact performance at all. I'll get to them in a second as well. Actually, sometimes need to refresh the dashboard for the questions, so I'll take a look in a sec. Okay, let's get to real tricks. A real trick is actually related to ptrace. ptrace is the Linux debugging interface, and it has something called ptrace me. ptrace me means basically I'm attaching a debugger to myself, and it, it usually is like this, but you have a child and the child wants to be debugged by the parent, right? Now, if you actually do the other way around, you actually start a debugger and then you want to mm, debug the child, when you do a fork in the debugger, you do ptrace me, uh, sorry, ptrace trace me, and then you, you know, exec the, the child and it's going to be debugged by the parent process. Now, if the child does it as well, and the debugger is attached, this call will fail, because there is already a debugger attached and you cannot have two debuggers attached. I mean, neither on Windows, neither on Linux, you cannot have two debuggers attached. So if the child tries to be debugged again while it's already debugged, it will just fail. So that's another method to actually detect a debugger, a pretty good method actually, and a pretty, uh, pretty widely used one. So let's do that. Okay, uh, now I need to do ptrace, uh, let's just print out the result. Okay, that's the request, bid is zero, which means myself, and then two more zeros for address and data. This doesn't really matter, yeah, and I think that's it, so let's compile it.
so it's zero now. If you uh, if we go actually to the manual, zero means okay if I remember correctly. Yeah, the debugging interface manual is pretty huge. Return value on success, uh, blah, blah, blah. Other requests return zero. So zero is success, which means, yeah, we correctly as a process at the, well requested to be debugged, basically. Now well, let's do the same from GDB. And run and minus one because, well, Obviously, it's already debugged by, well, GDB, so it basically detected the debugger. So in the end, it boils down to simple tricks which try to, which basically reveal that there is a debugger attached to. And uh, obviously, there are more, more of such tricks on, um, on Linux, so I'm not going to go through all of them because, well, first of all, I don't really know most of them. Uh, I guess another method would be just doing checking the parent PID and then seeing if the parent by accident is called actually GDB. You could also do that, right? I think there's like the P mm, P PID. Mm. How do you get parent PID? I thought that was PID. Well, whatever. Yeah, there are, um, worst case scenario, you can actually do check in um, proc self stat. And uh, this number here tells the ID of your parents. So you can then go to, you, oh, of course, programmatically to um, read link on exe file or just exe, I think. Uh, yeah, but that's not what I meant. Yeah, read link on it and it will tell you the name of the binary. Well, obviously, since I'm using the self link, this told me been read link, but otherwise it might, for example, tell you GDB. So yeah, and this trick you can also use on Windows, a similar one, right? But there are more debuggers on Windows, I guess. So let's move to some actually Windows specific things. So I'm going to leave this. Okay. When is Gunvale going to make the feed scroll or otherwise accommodate this question that's longer than five words? That's a good question. Hopefully soon. Okay, um, there are so some questions, so I'm going to go through them. Anti, uh, yeah, anti-reverse engineering for embedded devices, but uh, I already read that one. And the answer here is you can use things which do not actually impact pr performance, like instruction reordering in a weird way or um, the usual one is what you do is you basically, yeah, oops, that's not what I meant. Yeah. You basically have your code, right? But in the binary, you store your code in the firmware, for example, you store your code in uh, encrypted format. So this is encrypted. And then you add a piece of code, which actually decrypts it or deobfuscates it or whatever you call it, because it's not really encryption because the key has to also be here, right? So when this starts to execute, then you basically, this code decrypts it and puts it, for example, in RAM. So this, I guess, cannot be an architecture where you cannot run code out of RAM. And after it's decrypted, then you just go here jump here and start executing the code normally. This is the most common technique. It's called, uh, but basically like packers use it or sometimes called to protectors. It's basically packer or protector is an application which applies mm, generic anti-reverse engineering tricks to your application. Yeah. Um, so this can be used, this method can be used in some embedded stuff because it only, if you like dump the firmware from EEPROM, for example, then you get an obfuscated encrypted blob. And if you dump it from RAM, that's a different thing. Or if you get the key and decrypt it yourself, that's a different thing. But again, anti-reverse engineering tricks are not a perfect protection. They buy time for you. Yeah. Uh, another good resource is on GitHub. Mm. Let me take a look. Crap. I have problems copying from our panel, but GitHub com. This is from Dick uh, Svensson. Yeah, 
I'm going to give you the link since again. Yeah. So uh, it's a collection of, of anti debugging techniques for Windows. Perfect. So thank you for the link. I did paste it on, on channels and so on. And uh, yeah, in case you're actually watching this video as a recording, then here we go. I should also start correct collecting the links and putting them in the description, but yeah, I need to chat with my, my crew how to make it in a decent way. Uh, disconnected says that the last problem was not related to pwn dbg. Mm, pwn dbg has proc command. Uh, yeah, I know. Not that I use it, but I know. <laughs> mm. There's also a comment from Duga who says close free. I don't remember well. Uh, I'm not sure what close. What, what, what context is it? Is it for? Okay, uh, let's uh, go to Windows specific tricks. So in Windows, it's a little easier because there is actually an API called get. Uh, uh, sorry, is debugger present. And well, you can call this function and check if the debugger is present, which I guess will say true or false depending on whether the debugger is present. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a, a really simple API. I'm, I'm going to actually show you how it looks on the inside because it's really simple as well. And therefore, uh, why, why is my what? For some reason, my. Mm, Okay, that's pretty weird. Where is my Konemo? It's not here in any way, any case. Yeah, okay. Let me try it again. No, it still spawns the other console. I have no idea why is that, but okay. Yeah, we'll have to make do with, with what we have. So gcc test.c and yeah, and run it. It's zero now because there's no debugger present, obviously. And I'm going to debug it with gdb, for example. It could be any other debugger. It works for any other debugger as well. Because I'm going to make the uh, sorry the defaults. Yeah. All right, here we go. And run, and it says one now because well, it actually the debugger is obviously present. So. How does this work? And it's actually an API in, where is it? In kernel 32, it's this one, but I'm not sure if it's in kernel 32 or actually in kernel base. I think it's in kernel base, but let me just grab both files from my Windows system, 32 directory. And let's start with kernel base to see if it's actually imported or exported. Um, uh, yeah, it was there. Is the bugger presence here? Yeah. So I'm going to launch it in IDA. And wait until it actually loads. And I'm showing you this because the second trick is actually do doing what the function does without, without, um, well, using the API, right? Because what a uh, reverse engineering what a reverse engineer could do is uh, they could put a breakpoint on is the bugger present, and if this call is made, then just like change EAX to zero and return. So, so yeah. So another way is actually using well the method. Uh, yeah, this is the whole function. It's just, it does only this. On 32-bit, it uses another register, but it also basically does this. And it basically, the GS register is a segment register which points to or describes a segment where the thread environment block is located. It's basically a, a system structure with uh, quite interesting stuff. I did chat about it a little on previous streams. And uh, there on like in tab on, 68 is actually a structure which, uh, or a, 
um, yeah, let's, let's go to a structure which um, has some flags and one of them is tells you whether a uh, debugger is present or whether it's not present. So, so yeah, all is debugger present. Mm. Das is actually just fetches this value and then like fetches, um, well, uh, fetches this address and because there's an address and then fetches from that address this part. Or maybe it's, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mixed up. This address has a pointer to PB and the P uh, process environment block and the process environment block. Hmm. Once again. Yeah. PB and the process environment block has this flag. Yeah, now that's correct. Uh, too long I haven't done stuff on Windows in reverse engineering, it seems. I'm forgetting things. So yeah, so this is one thing. Now, a different trick is, for example, related to, is even documented, is related to the close handle API. If we go to the description of close handle on um, MSDN, MSDN is basically your source of truth-ish uh, about the APIs, not, not as good as reverse engineering, obviously, but yeah. And uh, it basically has a different, a different return value if a debugger is present. So you could basically use this function to check if uh, if a debugger is, is present, basically, because it if it fails, it uh, returns a value of zero, but otherwise, and under a debugger, it will throw an exception. So let's try it. And I guess there are a couple of questions. So close handle, and then I'm going to just put here an invalid handle value. Uh, can I, is there an, there's actually, um, actually a define called invalid handle valuable. I always forget the exact wording. Now oh, here it is, perfect. And I guess I'm going to, did I save it? I'm not sure. Yeah. So it says one now, which probably means, uh, I don't know what it means. It means that it worked. Why did it work? It shouldn't work. It's like invalid handle value, but okay. I'm going to put some other handle value. Like, yeah, well, this doesn't make too, too much sense. This is totally an invalid handle. Usually handles are actually, handle is a number, but it's basically an index in a, in an array in the kernel, kinda. And it actually is usually dividable by the pointer size, or four at least. It doesn't like me doing this, so I'm going to do a force a cast. Okay, now it says zero, which is fail, which is correct. And I'm going to run it under the debugger and run it. No, and it's exited normally. So, hmm. why? Handle value that is not valid or a pseudo handle. This can cap happen. Mm. Okay, let's do it in a different way. Maybe it's not the correct type of invalid handle. Let's close a handle which we actually open. So I'm going to. There is an API called open file. It's actually deprecated. You shouldn't use it, but it has less parameters than. Mm then other stuff what do you need how do you close it yeah close handle okay perfect then create file which normally you should use so open file let's open a file what file do we want to open i don't know like just something like this then oh it is i don't know can it be null I hope it can be null. And then style. And the style is create. Uh, yeah, create. That maybe exists. And write, perhaps. Is the right? Read right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. I'm going to start with printing the handle value itself just to see if it works. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. No, this didn't work. I guess null here is not really... How does this uh, function need to be initialized? C bytes, the size, yeah, so I thought. That's typical for Windows structures. Uh, sorry, I need to recompile it. Okay, now it worked, and it says one which is worrying me a little. One isn't a correct handle. Let's see what close handle says on it. It says zero, which is incorrect. Oh, which... I guess I should fall back into create file after all. I don't really trust this handle I'm getting. Yeah, let's not use deprecated APIs. Okay. Mm. ASDF then desired access. Desired access is generic write. Then we have a uh, share mode, which can be zero, 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 and zero. This should work, I guess. Yeah, it works. Let's see if I can actually show the handle as well. And it's minus one because I probably should have a create this position as well. Mm, create, always create. Yeah, that sounds, sounds good. Now create this position as this one. Why is it minus one still? Sure, mode was okay. This is okay to be zero. Flags and attributes. Do I have to add really some flag and attribute? I'm pretty sure I don't. Just my luck. Maybe there is already a file created with that name. And it doesn't like, yeah. Yeah, it. Create new. Maybe I create new is doing something else when I thought. Only if it doesn't exist. If it exists, okay. Mm. Create always. I thought actually they were doing the other way around. So let's do it again. Yeah, now it's fine. 12 is a proper handle value for, for Windows. Close handle. Let's see if it, it's one. And let's do it the same under the debugger. No, it didn't crash. Uh, the, the probable reason it didn't crash is because GDB is actually catching the signal, which I am suspecting. So we can try a different, a different debugger. And uh, let me just open a different debugger. A different debugger could be, but to use a different debugger, I need to do this static GCC. Oli DBG sounds perfect. Hello, Oli. No, though. No. Oli doesn't support this kind of files, and I don't have a new Oli. My bad. X86 debugger, then. Okay, let's try this one. And uh, let's run it. Will it? It will probably just shut down my console. Yeah, okay. It actually did crash, which under a debugger saying it's an inval exception invalid handle. So again, while running out of debugger, it doesn't crash. While running inside the debugger, it does crash. You could obviously catch this exception in your program after obviously the debugger sees it, and then say, well, this is running under a debugger. So 
yeah, again, you should probably find a list for of such tricks on Windows because there's quite a few of them and use that. Now I'm going to give you one more generic trick. I'm not going to implement it, but I am going to tell you how how to do it. It's basically what you do is you have a at the beginning of your code you do you measure time as in you get the current time for example uh, using uh, clock from yeah, clock tx and then some code passes and then you do another clock uh, sorry clock t y and you get the difference of them right and if you think that here somewhere in this code it's a high chance of somebody check like setting a breakpoint then resuming the program the re resuming the program right then a lot of time will pass because you know a breakpoint will, will hit and then somebody will look in the debugger look at the register and then continue so it will take probably several seconds but usually this goes for example co sorry this code usually runs in under like one second and so you just check like here right after the second measurement did this code run under one second or above one second if it ran above one second then i'm probably being the bug because somebody hit a breakpoint somewhere there so it's a pretty generic method it works on most platforms it's quite easy to detect obviously but but yeah um it's good to know another similar trick is based on how the how the how the bugging works how a breakpoint works and well it basically boils down to it's platform specific meaning it's different on Linux it's different sorry it's different on x86 it dif it's different on uh, arm and different on, on MIPS on spark and so on and so on so for example when a breakpoint is set on a given address like for example on the address of this instruction in, in memory right what happens on um, on x86 is that the byte of the instruction, well, obviously not this byte, but you know, machine code byte, is written into the, deb the debugger's uh, memory, and the debugger writes this opcode there, cc. Cc is actually the opcode of int3, which is uh, break uh, point, like debugger, sorry. basically a debugger exception or a debugger interrupt and uh, then when the breakpoint hits it actually because the cpu executes this instruction and sends a, a signal or an exception into the debugger well into the operating system and the operating system passes it to the debugger and the, the debugger sees oh this location right i actually do know that this location is my breakpoint so i'm going to tell the user that the breakpoint hit so what you could do is you could actually scan your the code of your memory and look for well maybe not breakpoints the usual way you do it is you mm, let's maybe make a drawing you have a piece of code right and you scan for example from here to here and calculate the checksum of it this is like for example your uh, text section right which, which contains code obviously and you calculate the checksum and it turns out that is like i don't know something like this right and then you you do it in for example a separate thread like one time per second or 10 times per second if somebody actually did place a breakpoint here so they had to put here the the cc upcode right and if they did put the cc upcode there then that means well um, the checksum will change, you will get a different checksum, which is like something else. And if the checksum differ, then you probably are being debugged and you can detect it. So this is a, another generic method, which is also commonly used. Uh, mm, yeah, okay, so I'll think about some other generic methods and let me look at the questions. soon as my question panel shows up okay is there any good resource for learning the kernel api of windows and why does microsoft hide some syscalls like having to extract them from ntdll um it's actually a really good question so it's like this i don't think there is a really good resource anywhere but on msdn there is the description of some of them now if you want a list of syscalls right then you just go to mateusz Jurczyk's page which would be 
a Euro Vexillium Orc and you have yeah, you have syscalls here like well, Win32K and Windows kernel syscalls. Now if you actually Google for for one of the syscalls, let's, let's do it right now, like for example this one. Usually mm, a couple of pages pop up, which uh, surprisingly I am not seeing here now. Okay, um, there is, uh, let's, this is maybe a too, too new API. I'm going to look for an API which was actually in older Windows versions, like for example this one. I have no idea what this is, I'm going to check. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems that the usual places I actually looked up are deprecated, as in I cannot find them anymore. There were two blocks to pages which actually had a description of uh, a lot of places from Windows API. And there was actually a book also uh, on the API, but it was for Windows 2000 and, and the like. Oh, I guess Process Hacker has at least some some stuff, well, the de definitions. Now, the definitions you can find in you can find them in, for example, Windows Driver Development Kit. I think it's called a different a different name, like Platform SDK or something like that. But uh, yeah, usually the definitions are there, and if you start looking into documentation for the kernel, there is the there is usually also the documentation for the API. But with one funny change, instead of Z, uh, instead of NT, you usually find like ZV letters here. It's basically the same API, but it's it's uh, meant to be called from the kernel process and not from not from the uh, from as a syscall, but it's the same API and the same description applies. Oh, this book I actually wanted to get up and fetch it from my bookshelf, but uh, since since it's already here, then then yeah, let's just advertise it. Yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah, there's something called Windows NT 2000 native API reference. This is also a good resource for the, well, most of the syscalls, not all of them, obviously. And another resource is the Windows Research Kernel, which I already mentioned today. If you, if you can get it, because it, it has a somewhat strict license, then, then basically you can just take a look what the API does. And uh, if, obviously it's pretty old kernels, but still m most of syscalls were passed. And apart from that, you can look in React OS. What uh, they have their own implementation, obviously because uh, of reasons, but it's a good source of information as well in React OS source. Uh, as you probably know, most of you know, I think React OS it's actually a Windows re-implementation. Uh, it's open source. And it looks like uh, like this, and it's I think it's either in late alpha or early beta. It has been like this for the last ten years, but yeah. But there is some some APIs are and syscalls are implemented. You can just take a look at them. So these are I guess the usual sources which I would recommend looking at. First, I, I think one more, but I forgot it. Mm, cool. I guess the PEB, PEB, or Process Environment Block, memory is read-only. Uh, no. Or you can at least make a process write to it. It's uh, it's not placed in any weird block, block of memory. So the debugger can, for example, change the being debugged to not being debugged, and a lot of debuggers have plugins which do that. Can you change PEB? Yeah, but I, I guess I answered this this question. Yes, you uh, you could do that. Um, how do you do with O3 quirks, like the crazy optimized module operation in the last challenge? Uh, you scratch your head a lot, but to be honest, apart from some weird math, you don't really deal too much with O3 craziness, as in it's still somewhat readable. 
unless you fall into math category and it starts using like AVX2 instructions when you you boil down to good old assembly reverse engineering. I don't think there's a good way apart from actually trying to understand and read the code. Obviously the aforementioned modular operation which got translated into this weird set of shifts and ors and other stuff you i guess you you have to get familiar with such tricks to recognize them you maybe not even don't even have to know what exactly they are doing but just recognize them and know oh this is probably like a modular operation written in a fast way and there aren't a lot of that tr tricks like that there are a limited set of them usually related to modulo and division operation so that's it okay um yeah i guess i've already told you about the most of the basic techniques as in the types of the basic techniques because again enumerating all the tricks doesn't really make sense but I'd, i would advise you actually to if you're interested to take a look and find a good list of all the modern tricks you can use to detect a debugger on windows on linux um, there's also a similar problem of detecting a virtual machine because some applications don't like being run on virtual machines so detecting a virtual machine is also another thing another topic which is quite interesting and there are tricks on that uh, as well and peter ferry actually i think also issued a paper on it like with a huge collection of stuff mm. yeah ntn 2000 that's outdated that's correct it is outdated but not all syscalls changed like uh, there are a lot of new ones but a lot of old ones as well hmm i think if i can if there is any obvious technique which uh, which I forgot to tell you about. Yeah, I guess usually it boils down to if you want to protect your application to actually creating a packer which takes the executable and does something with it or when doing, well, when compiling the code then actually doing some, yeah, I didn't mention totally, I didn't, the totally skipped obfuscation part where obfuscation is, for example, one of the most funny obfusca obfuscations I saw was a jump spaghetti, basically, which was, you read the code like this, there was an instruction of assembly, which done something meaningf meaningful, and then there was an absolute jump, which jumped somewhere else in the code, and there was only a jump, which jumped somewhere else, jump, 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 another meaningful instruction, jump, 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 jump another meaningful instruction, and so on, and so on. So, yeah, reading through that code was funny, because you had to like going instruction by instruction in IDA just didn't make any sense because the code was all around the place. It was like totally spaghetti, like best go to spaghetti I ever saw. So the way you approach such stuff, but that's anti-anti reverse engineering, which isn't really the topic of today, but the way you approach such stuff is for example using tracing. I just like traced the execution and um, noted all the instructions which using a script obviously which were not jumps not absolute jumps and that really really helps reverse engineering so uh, yeah a different obfuscation technique is for example to break your disassembler a common way is to have a jump like a local jump which jumps to the last byte of the local jump itself or into the middle of some instruction. So if you have a disassembler flow and it disassembles the jump, for example, which is a conditional jump, and then there is the next instruction and the next instruction, if you jump into the middle of it on x86, you can still decode it and as a different instruction then the disassembler would normally see. That being said, such tricks are usually not buying a lot of time because on in IDA it's just like to keep to key presses to undefine the code and redefine it from a given offset and yeah, so that doesn't buy too much time but it is there then yeah i did mention already trying to get all the code and encrypt it or pack it like compress it and then during execution actually decrypt it decompress it because if you have such a code before you start analyzing it in ida you actually have to decrypt it and actually bring it back to 
an executable file which you can read in IDA probably or decrypt it in IDA by writing some script. So that also buys some time, especially if you if the uh, decryption mechanism is actually has a lot of anti debugging tricks like detecting a debugger and so on. So yeah, um, but again, all in all, mm, all the all the non hardware based reverse anti reverse engineering techniques have been broken in the past and like all of them and most of the hardware ones as well but that's harder to do so so yeah just keep in mind that if you want to secure your application you, you are just buying time and i guess i'm going to finish at today what what about the nouveau yeah the nouveau was broken as well so i i don't remember the details but i just remember that it was broken eventually so okay, I guess we can round it up for today. Next week on Wednesday and then Thursday there will be two English streams by Artem Honorary Bot who, who will be doing basically win those kernel debugging. So that's about it. And and yeah, thank you very much for coming. I would like to thank you Kshaku for being the moderator today and Foxtrot Charlie for preparing the slides. And I would like to yeah, again invite you for the next week and take a look at the Pony Award nominations. They are really cool. So yeah, thank you. Bye bye and have a great evening. If you have any questions, just put them in the comments down below. And that's about it. So see you. I'm going to leave you with mission number 10. Good luck. <laughs>